Let's give it a second here. We've got 75, almost 80 people in, over 100. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Brad Conklin. I'm the school business official at Valley Central. So welcome to our first um, public webinar in this. So <laughs> bear with us as we deal with any technical difficulties. So I got the YouTube stream uh, going here on the side, but we've closed that out. So Patty, if I can ask you to do a favor. I'm going to kick it over to Marianne. Go ahead. Okay. So thank you all for being here with us tonight. We're very excited. And what Brad was trying to tell you is that this is our first time using Zoom for a meeting of this magnitude. So bear with us if we have any technological difficulties. Um, I want to start by introducing our superintendent, Mr. John Exanthus. Okay. Thanks very much, Marianne. And good evening, everybody. I just, I have just a very brief, just a few acknowledgements before we get uh, started. And I want to start with Marianne Serator, Bill Miller, Brad Conklin, Connie Griffin, and uh, Patty Bear, who oversaw our entire, and our entire task force, I should say, and the entire school community. Um, under the leadership of the people I mentioned, the task for, force and the, the entire school community, I'm sorry, we were able to put together a plan that we've felt has served the Valley Central community very well. Um, I was at a meeting today for uh, technology and Chris Moore, uh, our technology director, uh, said to the people on the committee, and I thought it was a great analogy and I hope he doesn't mind me stealing it, but uh, he was saying, uh, this reminds us of the movie Apollo 13, although it really happened in life. You know, Apollo 13 was out there and we're kind of out there plotting as we go but we're going to get it. We're going to get the, the missile back. We're going to get the, the mothership back to uh, um, Valley Central and hopefully the, uh, the rest of the community, certainly uh, the uh, county. Um, in the uh, movie, one of my favorite uh, lines is the steely eyed missile men. And I'm so proud to say that we have about 600 steely eyed missile men. Uh, everybody in their own capacity is working very, very hard. Uh, to do the best we can for our kids in our community. And I, I want to also thank uh, Joe Bonds here with me tonight, the uh, president. We cannot do this without support of the, of the board. And they've been very, very supportive. And they've been with us along the way. We certainly speak to them, tell them what we're thinking. And uh, they're a great sounding board of uh, uh, seven people that we're, we're very fortunate to have. So. At that point, I'll be quiet, and I know there's a lot of questions. Oh, I also want to thank Assemblyman Colin Schmidt. Nice to see you, Colin. Thank you for coming. Assemblyman Brian Miller. And I don't know if Jonathan Jacobs, some of you and Jonathan Jacobs on, but if not, I just, I think he'll be on at some point. But thank you very much for joining us tonight. And thank you all the support you showed at Valley Central and our schools. We really appreciate it. Marianne? Or Joe, sorry. I'm sorry. Yep. Yep. Thank you. So, um, so yeah, I just I just wanted to recognize that you know there's some frustration in the community regarding comments from our board meeting this past Monday night, and um, although the board is made up of individuals uh, who can have varying opinions on on different topics, all, all board decisions and actions are are based on the majority. And you know, I, I just want to reiterate that the majority of the board is in favor of increasing in school uh, instruction. And, and we, like many of you, are eager to bring our students back as soon as possible um, you know, in, in a safe manner uh, for, for the students and the staff as we look to reopen. Um, you know, based on the guidelines we have today, uh, we are gathering data and developing a plan to increase in-person instruction using partitions. Any, any changes or clarifications to these guidelines. And of course, we'll have to reassess and, and you know, modify our plan if necessary. But um, you know, I just wanted to, to share that. Uh, on, on a more personal note, you know, 
I, I can tell you, I, I have a, a son in high school and, and the transition from, from summer to school is challenging, uh, especially in a, in a virtual environment. And uh, I can tell you because I have his permission to tell this story. Um, you know, early in the year, uh, I heard some talking and laughing coming from his uh, classroom. And uh, I went in to check on him and I opened the door and, and, and you, you would have thought he saw a ghost. And uh, he, he advised me that they were discussing homework and, and maybe they were, I just don't remember homework being that funny. But, <laughs> but, but anyway, it, it was a minor infraction that, that we had discussion about. And, and I guess my point is, you know, my, my student, my family, my challenges, some of them may be the same as yours, some of them may be different than yours, but um, we, we are in this together. And, um, you know, we are, we are with you uh, we hear you uh, loud and clear, and we get it. So, um, you know, just pr appreciate uh, having the opportunity to, to share that. So I'm going to go ahead and flip it over to Mr. Miller now. Just going to unmute myself. Well, thank you for having me here tonight. Uh, I, too, have a, uh, a son in school. He's a junior at Sequoia Valley Central School. And most of you know, uh, don't know where that is, but it's up here at the upper end of my district uh, in New Hartford, New York. And uh, he's, became a, he's become a bedroom troll. And the virtual learning uh, for him has been a, uh, uh, you know, a real challenge. Uh, but the school is on a uh, A-B uh, you know, schedule. So it's, it's starting to, you know, work out. You know, I agree with everything that we're trying to do here. You know, we need, he needs to go back to school and we need our kids back, back in school. But, uh, you know, like I said, I'm here to listen. I'm here to answer any questions. Um, I'm sure that everybody's trying to do the best that they can, that they can. I know the pandemic's been a, uh, it's, it's been going on a year now. Um, a little history on myself. I was, I was uh, the assemblyman who got the uh, COVID-19 virus back on March 23rd last year. And I spent two weeks on a ventilator, 33 days on a, uh, an ICU and two months in rehab. So I've gotten uh, to experience this from, from, uh, from, from the ground floor up. But, but I know it's not about me, it's about getting our kids back to school. And uh, today I want to share this with you. I just check in my emails and uh, there seems to be a uh, bill starting to be uh, worked on in the assembly. It's called Opening New York School Bill. And, and what it does, it's asking to uh, terminate the executive order uh, by concurrent resolution to modify the distance from six feet to three feet. Um, I don't know where it's going to go, but I just wanted to share that with you. It is be, things are being worked on. We are talking about it. So um, I guess I'll, I'll uh, I've said enough, and uh, thank you for having me here. Thank you so much, uh, Assemblyman Miller. And I have to tell you that is like uh, news to my ears to hear that. So let's hope that that comes to fruition because that would help out the school districts a great deal. Um, and now we have Assemblyman Schmidt. Did you want to say a few words? Sure, thank you, and thank you for having me on this evening. I am a proud 2008 graduate of Valley Central School District, and uh, it, it's an honor to be able to participate and represent part of the school district in the New York State Assembly. As uh, my colleague Brian Miller stated, uh, we're pushing to do everything we can do at the state legislative level to ensure we can return to five days a week of in-person education safely. Um, I have been leading the charge on February 25th, and you can visit my Facebook page for anyone who hasn't seen it. I directly questioned the Commissioner of Health, Dr. Zucker, about getting updated guidance for school reopening following the latest CDC guidance that had been issued, as well as updated reports that we've received from leading medical institutions such as the Harvard Institute of Public Health, which is saying that the current New York State guidance is really out of date and what's been causing a lot of issues for Valley Central and other school districts. The commissioner at the time had indicated that within a week, the end of the next week, he would get that information out. Obviously, at this point, he has not done that. Yesterday, we sent other formal 
uh, request to the commissioner and to the Department of Health to explain why they did not meet the deadline that he had personally stated during the legislative hearing and ask for an updated timeline. Uh, we're still pushing the Department of Health to provide these answers. I know it's very frustrating for all the families. I think the fact that Massachusetts, which is a neighboring state to us, has updated their guidance within the last week to say three foot of guidance with additional exemptions for local districts with unique needs show that there is no reason the state guidelines should not be updated to accommodate our children being back in the classroom safely for in-person education. So I am here to listen as well, uh, participate. Anyone who needs anything above and beyond uh, this gathering here, please do not hesitate to reach out to my office, and I'm going to continue to press directly on uh, the Commissioner of Health at the statewide level to get these guidelines as they are responsible uh, to do for all of us. So thank you again, and happy to be with you. Thank you very much. We, we appreciate your support a great deal. So um, just to let you know the way that this is going to work. So we had a Google form that was sent out to the public. They've had uh, a number of days to ask their questions. And I just wanted to let you know that at this time, there was 41 responses. So we have a panel here, as you can see, of administrators and um, Connie Griffin, our district um, nurse coordinator. And so we are going to um, basically try to answer the questions that are in our area of expertise. Um, I wanted to start just by saying, reading the first comment. And the first comment that was on here from a parent um, said, um, have, you, have you asked our neighboring districts how they are able to reopen, yet we are not? I would like to see the proactive approach the district had in the summer. The district leadership has become complacent with the current plan and it is unacceptable. And the reason that I'm starting with that comment is because I, I, don't, I think that could not be further from the truth. Um, our superintendent is meeting regularly, daily with the other superintendents in Orange County. Um, comparing one district to another is like comparing apples to oranges. But in the case of Valley Central, I can tell you that Valley Central was the largest school district to open on time in September for all students K-5. Our self-contained students, our ALC students, our Viking Academy students have received in-person instruction five days a week since September, minus the pauses. Our ENL students are now getting five day a week instruction. At the secondary level, they created a four day a week team, which they recently um, turned into a five day a week team for at risk students. At risk 12th graders have been invited to come back five days a week in order to ensure that they graduate. As we said in our original plan, um, Wednesdays were going to be added to the um, to the in-person instruction. We are one of the only districts in Orange County that does not have an asynchronous day, which means that our students have more teacher-student contact than any other district in the county. Um, recently, we've surveyed, um, a few weeks ago, we surveyed parents to see if their 100% online students wanted to come back to hybrid, and we were able to accommodate 100% of those students that asked to come back to hybrid. The principals have been working to bring back as many students um, as possible. Um, since February, um, the middle school has been able to bring back, I believe it was something like an additional 75 students. So they have approximately 135 um, to 155 students coming five days a week. And the high school has approximately about the same 155 students coming five days a week. So with that being said, you're absolutely right. Now we're at a point where we would like to move into the next level, which would be bringing children back five days a week. And in addition to that, we actually, and Bill Miller can attest to this, we brought back all the sports that we are allowed to bring back. So any um, sport that we are allowed to play, Valley Central is playing. We're allowing parents to come to our outside um, events. So I feel like that we've hardly been complacent. Um, why are we starting to think about five days a week? Well, as everyone has been saying, the guidance is sometimes unclear. One department says one thing, one says the other. The New York State guidelines have said since the beginning that appropriate social distancing means six feet of space in all directions between individuals or the use of physical barriers between individuals that do not adversely affect airflow heating, cooling, ventilation. So 
Over the past few weeks, that particular guideline has been the topic of discussion at the superintendent's chiefs meetings. And that is why you're seeing some of these letters coming home from other districts. I'm saying that they're moving towards five days a week. No, Valley Central was not first at that point. And that was for a reason, because in order to, to use those physical barriers, Brea Conklin, um, our business official, um, researched that and we needed to have approval from the district architect to ensure that we were ordering the right ones and that he would write off on them. And so he did that and those have been ordered. So th this is where we're going. Now, before we talk to you a little bit about what that instructional plan could look like and answer the questions, I wanna turn it over to uh, Ms. Griffin, who is gonna answer the questions that you have mostly in regard to quarantine, which if, if you got my you know numerous messages over the last couple of days, you will see that we've had a lot of people going into quarantine. So Connie, did you wanna take over from here? Yes, I will, thank you. So good evening, everyone. So I'm gonna start reading the questions on, on reference to quarantine, but I'm gonna also be reading from documents that I have in front of me from the New York State Department of Health, as well as from the Orange County Department of Health to know that all my answers are coming from those documents. So one of the questions with the return of five days a week, do I foresee an increase yet again with quarantines? So remember a class that is in contact with someone that's positive, the whole classroom gets quarantined. So yes, I do see an increase in maybe the number in a classroom because our numbers will be increased. So I do see that um, even if the windows are open, anybody in a classroom does need to be under quarantine. So that is, I know we were taking the guidance from the Orange County Department of Health and I'm gonna read a document of one of their questions and answers in their Q&A documents. It said a student in a class test positive. Does everyone need to quarantine? The answer was all classmates and teachers or staff of the positive case should be placed on mandatory quarantine for 14 days. Now remember it was 14, they have lessened that down to 10 days now. So the original guidance on that is from the Department of Health. So the New York State Department of Health, I know they keep on saying Orange County Department of Health is making all these rules and it's making it harder in our county. So this document was released in February and it's just an update on the guidance on the context of a close or proximate contact of a confirmed or suspected case of COVID-19. So this is the guidance. If someone is diagnosed with a laboratory confirmed COVID-19, if person B had contact or close of close or proximate with person A, they would be subject to mandatory quarantine or precautionary quarantine. Mandatory or precautionary quarantine are the same thing. They're both on quarantine. Well, what's approximate setting? So under their bullets, it says a close contact is defined as being within six foot of a person displaying symptoms of COVID-19 or someone who has tested positive. Proximate contact is defined as being in the same enclosed environment, such as a classroom, office or gathering, but greater than six feet from a person displaying symptoms of COVID-19 or someone who has tested positive for COVID-19. And thus lies our issue. So anybody in a classroom setting Though they may not be a close contact within six feet or at six feet, they are with more than six feet. They're still considered a proximate contact and need to quarantine. So the, the next question was, why have other counties, these are guidelines, but Dr. Gelman has not. Well, Dr. Gelman is actually following the Department of Health and that is from the New York State Department of Health. So she has used a few guidelines um, in reference to quarantine that uh, the school nurses can now uh, release uh, any teacher or staff from quarantine. As long as we have, um, we've decided we're gonna need the letter from the Department of Health and that is gonna be placed on our website, an easy link. But any parents in the last two weeks and that was on a February 16th document that said that we can do that. I have um, been in touch with Dr. Reminar, our school medical director, and we have gone over that. So we will be clearing them. Um, based on only if they were on quarantine and if they were asymptomatic. So as long as they have no symptoms, we can clear them. We will tell the parents and the teachers where to go for that document and they will be directed to do that. And it's just a printout of a document, but they're attesting that they did stay quarantined and that they did stay symptom-free. The next question was um, from the Orange, for the, it's actually, uh, will the county be updating their county guidelines for quarantining? with New York, in line with New York State or even the CDC. And they are in line with the um, New York State Department of Health and the CDC currently. Um, like I said, they did uh, release that element of getting a healthcare provider note after quarantine. So we are in more in line with just the Department of Health and the CDC. 
And just to um, just go over the CDC document, uh, six feet is still within for CDC as well as the New York State Department of Health. So, and masking. So we all wearing masks and we're still staying six feet apart. The fact that we can come closer together, um, like three feet is with the barrier. So we have to have those barriers in place to do that. But again, this, it is not changed for the CDC or the New York State Department of Health. The World Health Organization has gone to three feet and the CDC is not following those or nor is the New York State Department of Health. So when, other, when you say in other states, and I know there's a lot of questions from parents about other states are doing this or other counties, um, the counties, like I said, if you read the Department of Health documents that have come out and all of these have been really really re-released in February, we are following everything that we can and we are quarantining who we need to. So let me see, I'm just gonna, oh, there was a question in reference to, is it possible to bring vaccines to the school to make sure we can get our staff um, vaccinated? Well, we, I know Mr. Miller will be talking about that in a little bit, but the staff are being vaccinated as, you know, as quick as possible. And they are currently working off an Orange County, um, the Orange Osterbosis list. And all teachers, if they wanted to be vaccinated, are being vaccinated. And again, this is a voluntary thing if they choose to get vaccinated. So, and can we've asked, and I know uh, Ms. Saratori has asked multiple times, can we please have a vaccination site at Valley Central? Um, she's asked multiple times. <laughs> and if they need a site, we are the first school that jumped up and said, you know, waving our arms saying, we'll do it. But they do have a um, permanent site now, you know, that they're using on 23 Hatfield Lane. They will be setting one up at Orange County Community College. And they have increased the number of pods as the vaccines have been become more abundant. So I just wanted to let you know that. Um, again, there was a question about putting pressure on to change the quarantine rules. Again, we are following everything with the New York State Department of Health. Uh, there was a question with safety, what safety precautions will be take place if students return to school five days a week? We will still follow all our rules that we have to, the six foot distancing in the hallways when they're there in lunchrooms, if they're in other areas, if they don't have barriers. The only time you will see that, I, you know, even in the lunchroom, I should say it'll be closer if we have those barriers up. But anytime in other areas where there's no barriers, they will be the six foot distancing with masks, hand washing as much as possible, you know, the hand sanitizer is there, but hand washing also with soap and water, wherever it's possible. And they will be um, kept apart that way. So we will be following all those rules. And there was a question about using lockers. And as soon as we have more guidance, the reason why we're not using lockers now is because we don't want students gathering. And that's where they uh, tend to spend much time in the hallways, you know, getting their stuff. And that's when they meet their friends or in the hallway. So we're trying to keep that distancing and we don't want to cross contaminate. So as soon as we can release those or and allow those locker usage, we will do that. Um, there was a question that um, we've been excluding too many people and that we're high on the list. It says um, Valley Central is high on the list of quarantining. That is true because we're we've been quarantining since September when we've opened and other schools have not opened. Um, so we have, do have a high number that have been quarantined. But again, we are following all the rules and we do know those rules and we, you know, multiple times we've questioned it. Um, occasionally we can have, if there's an attendance issue, we might not know the student was in. Um, we have gone back, we've talked to every parent. I know we're trying to make that personal connection to anybody that has been quarantined. We've called the parent to tell them that. There was a question on when are we told? So some parents are not told until a week later they state. And the point in is when we hear that someone is positive, that is the day we call. We don't wait a day, we don't wait a week. We call the same day we hear and we start calling at the same time we start hearing. So the minute we get all those lists, we disperse those lists within the health office and we have calls being made home to that parent. So um, we are not waiting. I know there was a, it states how long does it take to get notified? Um, and again, as soon as we hear, it may be from a contact from last week and we understand that and the child or student should have quarantined from last week. We did not know that, you know, and again, the parent usually tells us they might not tell us until a week later, say, oh, by the way, he had symptoms. He's been out of school. We didn't know that, but now he's tested positive. So we do let you know as soon as possible. And again, like I said, the day we hear is the day you hear. Um, they asked for the link for the Department of Health um, on the web, web page for the clearance letters that will be put there. 
And oh, uh, there are still a lot of cases of students and our staff testing positive for COVID. Won't bringing more kids back into buildings make more quarantines? Yes, because there's more children in the classroom. Hopefully not as many staff as the staff are being vaccinated. And, um, you know, and I, I think a good portion of our staff are. They won't have to quarantine after 14 days from their second vaccine or their first vaccine if they receive the um, Johnson & Johnson vaccine. So we're hoping to have, we won't have to close due to staffing. That's one of our hopes that, and that will happen quite soon. Um, Connie, there was a question in the chat is, um, are we um, suggesting to teachers that they should get vaccine vaccinated? So can you speak to that just for a second? So on a, per, on a personal note, if a teacher comes to me and asks to be quarantined, um, asks to be quarantined, they don't want to quarantine, sorry, <laughs> asks to be vaccinated, I do give my personal opinion. Um, I have to tell you, our nurses are vaccinated. I, I can't tell you everyone, I probably shouldn't speak on behalf of them, but I can tell you I am vaccinated. And so I won't be quarantined and also so that I can be there for our students. I think that is the wish of uh, teachers. Sometimes there's an underlying health condition in which they cannot get vaccinated. So they might not be vaccinated. Um, nor do I think they need to share that, but I'm hoping that, you know, most of our teachers know and are aware of it. And I think most of our teachers do want to be vaccinated. I know there's a big push to get vaccinated and they want to know when and where. Um, like I said, if Ms. Hertor had her way, we would have all been vaccinated as soon as they wanted the vaccine, they would have had it that day if they could have. So we are hoping that they get vaccinated soon. And I do personally believe, um, believe in this vaccination. I do believe it is a safe vaccine. I know there's some questions and I do believe the staff believe so too. So Connie, before I let you off the hook here, one of the questions in the chat is, um, and I think you've answered this, but I'd like you to answer it again. It says, what is legally preventing Valley Central from moving to quarantine guidelines like Westchester, Dutchess and Ulster, uh, which is you know, more the proximate and other counties in New York states, do we have to follow, follow the county? Would you mind answering that? Okay, yes. So the document in front of me is, is from the New York State Department of Health, not from the county, where it defines what a proximate contact is and what a close contact is. And in the situation in a school setting, the proximate contact in a school setting in a classroom, they have to quarantine also. So why are the other counties not following the New York State Department of Health? I believe they have, you know, the, their county has made a different ruling. And I'm not sure why, I don't wanna speak on behalf of them, but I know Orange County Department of Health is following the New York State Department of Health in that. And I think they're doing the right thing by doing that. Thank you, Connie. So I'm gonna kind of touch upon the instructional plan. And as I said, there's 41 responses here and they're really, they kind of represent the entire Valley Central School District. So there's some comments in here saying, get my kids back five days a week as quickly as possible. And then there's other comments in here that talk about why are you not allowing hybrid um, as a choice? And, should, and I should put out another survey. So in, within the context of the survey, just so you know, one of the question was if your child is currently 100% online and we say you can come back five days a week. Now they're 100% online. If, they're, if we go to five days a week in person, how many would come back? And right now we have um, about 53% of the 100% online students that would like to come back five days a week. As far as the hybrid students, um, out of the hybrid students, we have 89% um, that would like to come back to five days a week. So the majority of our public is saying they would like to come back five days a week. Is there, are there people out there that would like to keep with the hybrid model? Absolutely, they do exist. There's about 12%, 11, 12% of our population that is saying, I would like to stay hybrid. At this point, there's been no firm decisions made, but it will be very difficult, if not impossible, to have three models of instruction going on at the same time. And with that, I, I was remiss to not tell you that tonight we also have our VCTA president, Pasquale Leo, as well as our vice president, Holly Siegel here with us today. And really like we could not be doing any of this without the teachers that are working so hard to do what's best for your students, your children and our students. So to put three models into place, having some online, some five days a week, some two days a week, um, it would be very complicated, if not impossible. 
So we have made no firm decisions. We're going to continue looking at the data, um, listening to you, all of you, and then we will move from there. So the next question that I have, which seems to be a recurring question, is um, are they going to have to change their teacher? Um, I've probably spoken with a few dozen parents um, over the last few days, and, and that is a, is a big question. So right now, in some cases, we have teachers that are 100% online. If those students come back, we are going to do everything we can especially at the elementary level, to ensure that those students somehow stay with their 100% online teacher. However, that would mean that the 100% online teacher is now going to be a hybrid teacher, and she would teach some students in person and some home. There, there we don't have enough staff or enough space to have 100% online classes, hybrid classes, and five-day-a-week in-person -pers classes. Um, John, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but... Um, you have um, some fine 100% online teachers too. And, and I know that you've heard some concerns. Did you want to add anything to what I said about that, about trying to keep them with their current teacher? Um, we will do our very best, absolutely. I, I, it's, it's very, we know that it's very disruptive for children to switch teachers, especially late in the school year. So we are currently working on a plan on how we can make sure that they stay with uh, the same teacher. Um, all our teachers are great in all of our grades, but we will we will make our best effort for, to make that happen. Um, and, you know, I actually wanted to open it up to um, one of the teachers that we have in here, if, if you'd like, would you like to speak to like the difficulties of teaching hybrid um, with having students in your class and students um, at home? Or do, do you think that I did a good enough job? Pasquale, did you want to talk about that for a second? Sure, no, um, certainly there are challenges for uh, teachers when it comes to uh, implementing instruction on um, di different levels. Um, how it looks uh, in a kindergarten class looks completely different to, to how it might look in a high school class. Um, and the challenges that are presented are um, different and unique to each, each, each level. Um, there are certainly um, issues with uh, getting kids to attend um, some of the sessions and, and technology have been some, some of a bit of a concern there. Um, and just a learning curve that all the teachers have had to do throughout the year in order to get prepared for this has been has been challenging for them. Um, our teachers have done a great job meeting those challenges, and I feel like they um, have have learned a lot through the years. But it's it's been um, definitely arduous and trying, and we we're making the best out of a situation that um, nobody really wanted to be in. And I, th I think we're doing a great a great job um, getting to this point, but um, it, it's not been an easy road. Thank you, Pasquale. So one of the next question on here um, had to do with um, quarantining. If students go on quarantine, are we just gonna, not going to instruct them at all if they were in person? No, absolutely not. Um, any child that goes home on a quarantine will be provided with online instruction. Um, we've gotten pretty good at um, being flexible, so that would absolutely take place. Um, Another question was the students that are 100% remote, will they still be able to join Google Meets every day? That will stay exactly the same as it is. Online students will be going to their Google Meets um, just as they are now. Um, question about 100% remote children, can they play sports? Yes, just as they can now, 100% remote students are able to participate in all athletics. So here's the question. So one of the questions now, and I may ask one of the teachers to speak to this too, is if we go to five days a week in person and I'm an in-person kid and I'm sick, um, why can't I just join the Google Meet like I can now? Um, one of the problems that we are absolutely having is that we do have a lot of students that are technically hybrid students. They are supposed to be in school on certain days, but many of them don't show up. And what they do is they log on to the computer to get their classes that day. So even as I was walking the halls, I would say there's a lot of seats empty. Why are these seats empty? And a part of it is that we have a lot of hybrid students that don't come to school, but they participate online. Just like in the normal world, if we go to five days a week, they get their instruction in person. If they're not there, the teacher is going to provide them the homework and the materials that they missed. Will that probably be in Google Classroom? The, because that's what we use now? Yes. 
but they will not be able to log in and join the classes. It just makes it um, very difficult for us to control attendance and to know who's supposed to be in person, who's hybrid. So that is something that we're gonna continue to talk about, but um, that we have decided that if they're five days a week in person, they should be getting their instruction in person and then they will make up their work just like they always have. Um, Marianne, so, do you mind if I jump in just about um, the changing of the teachers? I know that was a question that middle school parents had. Thank you. Um, so no problem. So we will, students will stay with their teams. It's just that the periods might change. So if they go from a virtual section to an in-person section, the teachers will, and the team will remain the same. It'll just be about, um, again, just the change of the periods and which period English is or so on and so forth. There was only one group because we do have a separate virtual and a separate in-person and that would be any students that are in our 15 ones or our 12 one ones, um, that would be a change potentially. So to answer that question. And thanks, Jamie. That was actually the next one on my list. So you jumped in right where, at exactly the right spot. There is one here for the high school. Um, and it talks about the children's mental health, which is absolutely something that we're all worried about. And I know we talk about that all the time. And I know that there were board members the other night that were very clearly saying that we need to be worried about their mental health and that that's why they need to be in school. So this question is um, from a high school parent and it's asking, what are we doing specifically to um, assist in, in their mental health? Um, it talks about sports with absolutely, but um, are, there's, is there anything else we're doing? Uh, Mr. Burns or Mr. Conklin, did you wanna to speak to that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, from, the, from the very beginning, that's been at the top of our list as far as uh, connecting with our students. We uh, attribute their mental health to having um, positive interactions with each other and positive interactions with their teachers. And really, uh, you should be very proud as I am, uh, as a community of our teachers, I have seen them work, um, you know, giving 110% every single day and not only just uh, doing their jobs, but, but reaching out to students. We've had teachers uh, regularly doing home visits, uh, phone calls, uh, reaching out through email, anything that they possibly can, individual student meets to help the students uh, connect with them. And, uh, but we all feel this, we're, we all have pandemic fatigue and feeling disconnected from each other, feeling disconnected from our school. Uh, but I, I would have to say the best thing, and this is my opinion, the best thing that we can do for our students' mental health is to open up school. I've had the pleasure of seeing our athletes uh, come back to school. I've had the pleasure of seeing uh, some of our extracurriculars open up. I've had the pleasure of seeing uh, students come back. Uh, we had one come today and and our teachers uh, were ecstatic that this student came back into, this was a senior that uh, kind of uh, fell, fell off the map. Um, we have the best thing that we can do, in my opinion, in, uh, is to bring our kids uh, back into school. So I'll pass it over to Mr. Conklin as well. Uh, yeah, you know, we are just, we, we want to bring kids back. Um, and, and, you know, I'm proud of the high school that, that we are doing that. Um, you know, at an at-risk, uh, but it, like Mr. Burns said, we had uh, literally teachers today saying, I'm, I'm so happy that th this student showed up, you know, and what Ms. Serator said before, we, we do have spots and some kids aren't showing up and, you know, there's a difference with, with kids that want to come back and kids that do come back. It's, 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 uh, it, it's tough right now, but we, you know, we're doing everything we can to make sure, reach out to them and make sure their, their mental health is, is, is stable. And uh, we were telling them that we're here for them. And we will be here for them if, if they need anything. Thanks, Mike. One of the other things that we know is important is that they feel connected. So some of our clubs, like when sports came back, um, that was awesome for the kids and for their mental health, but also, you know, music and art and those type of things. We have kids that that is near and dear to their hearts as well. 
We are working with our um, advisors at the high school and middle school level to um, put together plans so that if they would like to bring their um, music groups or their art groups or whatever type of club they have back into in-person, um, that we will allow that as long as they have a plan in place that Ms. Griffin um, approves. So I know I was speaking to the high school uh, music uh, direct, uh, department chair the other day and she is absolutely doing that. Um, we are also trying to work on some events that we can have that are in person. Um, they're going to be small, but um, musicals are certain things. I know that I've spoken to our um, drama advisor to see if um, there's something they can do. So anything that we can do to make kids feel connected, that's what we would like to do. Um, in a few days, um, we will be sending out information about an organization called Project Hope. It really mostly deals with parents, but um, if you if you want your child to be with you at the time. It's an organization through Orange County and they're gonna do another Zoom meeting with parents. They're gonna send that out to offer some support um, for parents that are struggling with the pandemic. So we're looking forward to offering that to you as well. So the next- Marianne, Marianne I think John wants, wants to say something. Oh, go Marianne. ahead, sorry. No, I just want to, uh, were you gonna mention about the support for the region's kids or I don't know- yeah, but you read my mind. Great minds think alike. I was going to talk a little bit about um, the next question on here is like, how are we supporting students? So this summer, um, we are absolutely going to have a K-12 summer school program. And we have not had a summer school program for um, the little ones in Valley Central in, I think, over six years. I, I believe it's been quite a while. Um, it'll be extensive at every building. Um, all elementary schools will have a summer school program. We're actually writing a curriculum for that soon to make sure that all teachers are on the same page and that we're filling the gaps. We actually are gonna be providing transportation um, for that, which is something that we haven't done in the past as well. So we're looking forward to that. The middle school, we're excited. They're gonna have their normal academic program, but in addition, they are building a curriculum for um, a mental health component a social emotional to bring back two camps, two different groups of students um, to try to help with their transition back into the in-school setting. On top of that, when we found out that we had those four regions um, that we have to take, um, I have, I'm a parent too. I have a 27 year old and I have an eighth grader um, in another school district who is about ready to take two regions. And as I saw that, I was started to panic and I said to myself, we have to do everything we can to ensure that we have provided them with the instruction that they need to be successful. So always like my great ideas always mean more work for the building principals and their teams, but they actually, the department chairs, they climbed right on board with that and were very happy and had done similar things in summer school um, in the past. So we are gonna be building a program for those students, um, an in-person version and a, uh, a online version to offer support to the students that need to take those four regions. So you will be getting more information about that as well. So um, let's see. I believe there's some questions here, um, Mr. Conklin, about how we're gonna clean. Oh, there was a question in there about, did we order them? When did we order them? Yes, we ordered them. We ordered them a couple of weeks ago, a uh, week or so ago, but Mr. Conklin can talk a little bit about the barriers. And then there were some questions in here about cleaning and how we're gonna clean the barriers. Did you wanna take them, Brad? Sure, so um, there, there have been some questions about the barriers. We did place the order uh, last Wednesday. Um, we're expecting them between the next two and five weeks. Uh, we're, we're hoping it's more towards the two weeks. Um, but if you can remember, we placed a, a fairly large Chromebook order back in September, and they have still have not um, ended up here at the district. So we're hoping to get them as soon as possible and um, get them installed. The cleaning of them, that's, that is going to be a bit of a challenge. We do have our, our custodial staff is, is stretched uh, super thin. Uh, and, and just as we're dealing with uh, quarantines on the instructional side of things, we're also dealing them in the facilities department and our school lunch department. Uh, this week we have one, uh, one school building where the entire uh, kitchen is, is in quarantine. So um, uh, we're gonna have to work out a good plan to do them. We do believe that the sprays that are, that are being used uh, around the buildings will be appropriate. Um, 
but I can assure you that they, they will be cleaned. Uh, there was a question, is there any new clean or safety protocols, cleaning or safety protocols in the buildings? And uh, no, unfortunately, there are not any new procedures. Um, I say unfortunately, because we have gotten very good at, at cleaning the areas um, where a staff member has been and has tested positive. And we have also talked, uh, we had some staff meetings back in December, I believe, and we emphasized the point that we can clean surfaces uh, and, until you can eat off of them. Um, unfortunately, they're only as clean as the next person that comes around and, and touches that surface. So we encourage uh, our staff, our students to follow good hygiene, wash your hands um, and, and wear your mask at all times. And, and fortunately, I think, uh, Connie, correct me if I'm wrong, but we do not believe much spread has, has come from within the buildings. We feel like we do a very good job there. That is true. Thank you. So um, there's a question here about sports. Um, um, did you want to take that, Mr. Miller? Sure. Uh, the question's directed to the Orange County Department of Health Director uh, with regards to notification of Newburgh Free Academy as to the fact that they're in a yellow zone. Why were they notified late? Um, affecting the games that they were to be played that they're not allowed to host any home games. And although football, this is varsity football, and although I can't speak for the Orange County Department of Health um, director, I can say that the, or the communication between the Orange County Department of Health and Newburgh Free Academy, I can't speak to that. I can tell you that the athletic directors section wide have been working tirelessly to try to find alternate locations. It's no surprise, interscholastic athletics have been a challenge uh, starting back in the first week of February with the winter season. And what, you know, the weather certainly isn't helping us right now. We were hoping to be on our fields. Hopefully tomorrow we can get the rest of the snow melt and hopefully get our fields lined and be ready to go. Um, I will tell you that I did speak to our athletic director today and that Newburgh Free Academy varsity football game with Valley Central has been rescheduled at a neutral site. It'll be played at Monroe Woodbury High School on Saturday at 3 p.m. And unfortunately, there won't be any spectators permitted, uh, but the game has been rescheduled. A lot of the information that you can find related to athletics would be on the website with regards to spectators, uh, what's permitted, what's not permitted, the guidelines the spectators are gonna have to follow. And I would encourage anybody that son or daughter participate in interscholastic athletics that if you're going to a school that does permit spectators, I would constantly be checking on a daily basis to see that the game is gonna be played as scheduled before you leave for the game. We've already had a couple situations already this fall two season where we've had some teams have to quarantine and games be altered as a result of that. Um, Marianne, since I'm talking, there's just one other question I felt that was pertinent that I could help with. It was um, how many teachers have already been vaccinated and what percentage of the teachers are fully vaccinated? Uh, I spoke to Connie earlier today. I, I would only be able to venture a guess there. We would say that we think that 30 to 40% of our teachers have been fully vaccinated. Uh, to date, they're not required to, to notify the school district that they've been fully vaccinated. So it's purely on a voluntary basis. Um, I think more and more people are willing to do that, to, to willing to share that they've been fully vaccinated. And there may come a point in the near future where that is required. Um, in which case then we would be able to give an exact percentage of teachers that have been fully vaccinated and wouldn't have to quarantine as a result of exposure anymore. But um, to date, it's just a guess. Thanks, Bill. So there are some questions on here from, from staff. So I'm going to address those now. So one of the questions is, how are the desk dividers different from those that the teachers requested in August? And we were told that the fire marshal did not allow them. Brad, did you want to speak to that a little bit about what the regulations were at the time? Um, sure. So back in the uh, early, late part of the summer, when we realized that we needed to have uh, some dividers, 
Um, at the time, the, the focus was concerning uh, greeters desks and uh, areas across the district where office staff were close together. And at the time, the, the, um, the facilities department at State Ed had put out guidance that any barriers, uh, whether it be um, clear or um, uh, like a physical uh, wall barriers needed to meet certain uh, fire codes. Um, and uh, to be honest, when we when we started really focusing on looking at these barriers last week, um, as the conversation kind of heated up at the superintendent's level, um, we did reach out to our engineer uh, because the guidance uh, was from the state that you needed to have your architectural engineers sign off on these. And, and when we originally reached out, he had said that no art, no engineers are signing off on these because there is not enough data available from the manufacturers. And um, in, in conjunction with uh, our engineer and our director of facilities, we found another option. We presented it to the engineer and he was uh, uh, able to approve it for us. So that's, that's what made us confident enough to go ahead and, and make the purchase. It's a fairly large purchase, um, but we're very confident that these will be safe and able to use in the classrooms. Thank you. So the next question is about the dividers again, and it says if the dividers don't arrive in time, um, are we still gonna have kids come back at the three foot distance? And is the return of students contingent upon the dividers? Um, absolutely, bringing more kids in, absolutely. Even, I'm gonna say that even if these wonderful assemblymen are able to get this three foot thing passed and we're praying that you can do that quickly, we would still use the dividers. So even if um, the guidelines were to change to um, three feet instead of six feet, we have, we have the dividers, we believe they'll be helpful. So we were gonna use the dividers, whether it's three feet or six feet. Um, but no, we don't plan on bringing more kids back into the buildings until we have the dividers. And we also don't plan on bringing them all back in at once. This is absolutely going to be a phased in approach. We have seen that it is easier at the elementary level because those students are kept in cohorts. There's not a lot of quarantining going on at the um, elementary level. We have a staffing uh, issue that we had to deal with in an elementary school, but besides that, we have not had to quarantine elementary students in a long time. And let's hope I didn't just blow that by mentioning that. So we're absolutely going to be bringing in um, elementary first um, as you know, and I, you know, we have people out there that watch the Facebook and they tell us what's going on. And, you know, they did tell us that, um, you know, people were saying that one school is bringing kindergartners back five days a week um, and others weren't. And absolutely, that could be possible because the goal is to bring in as many kids as we possibly can five days a week. And if we can do it for some, we're going to do it for some. And there's a question in here about do kids with IEPs get preference? Yes, students that are at risk, and that is actually in the guidelines. They do get preference for coming back five days a week. Um, there's another question in here from staff member that has, you know, and it's about why don't we just let these kids that are absent come remotely? Well, then we're gonna have empty spots. Uh, you know, we're gonna have spots that aren't getting filled because on any particular day, someone may decide to stay home. And, and one of the um, parents in the chat over here said, well, that a parent can make their own hybrid and choose 100%, but only send them in when they want two or three days. And then the teachers have to provide online instruction. And that is not what we're planning on doing. Will we provide the instruction, um, homework, the assignments? Absolutely, but there won't be live instruction for that child that day. Um, but they will absolutely have access to the work. Um, the, the teacher asked here about the recalibration days and, um, you know, basically saying I haven't kept my word on that, but that's not really quite true. Um, we had a break in, Mar in February, a week off in February, and we have a week off in March. And we didn't think that um, between those two breaks that a recalibration day would be not that it's not necessary because it's absolutely necessary, but that, that it would be kind of troublesome for the parents to um, do that at this time. But we absolutely do plan on working to have recalibration days after the spring break. Um, they also said in here that the VCTA requested that um, we bring back the committee that we had this summer. Um, 
that worked on the online plan. I did bring that to the administrators and um, we discussed it and we thought that there was too much going on already, but then I worked, talked to the VCTA and they said they really would like to see that happen. So I give you my word that as soon as I can fit in another committee, which will be this month, um, you know, we could possibly meet with that committee again and I'll send out an invitation and we'll do that. So, Marianne, yes. If I could just jump in, because I, I was looking at the chat, there's a couple of questions about the, people feel as if the district should be encouraging people to be vaccinated and tested. Um, I, I don't think we need to encourage anybody to, to be vaccinated. I, it's, it's like giving out free money. We're sending out text, emails. Um, you know, we heard a rumor that this, this drugstore has vaccination, vaccinations uh, available. Um, it's like hot off the presses. We have people that are more than willing to get vaccinated. And I mean, we had back at the first week in March, BOCES reached out to us, to all the schools in Orange County and wanted um, a list of any staff member that would be willing to be vaccinated in our school. And by the time Mary Ann and I sent it out, uh, within five minutes, we had 10 responses. And eventually three days later, we sent over 300 names to BOCES to be, uh, to be on a list, to be fully vaccinated, to be vaccinated. So, I mean, we're encouraging people to be vaccinated. And as far as testing, I think our staff, as everybody has said, you know, going back to September, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we've, we've had our staff uh, all total ten, tens of thousands of tests that, that people have had as a result of coming out of quarantine or uh, you know, to avoid quarantine, uh, quarantine related to travel, tests related to results of travel. So um, our staff being vaccinated, our staff is being tested for sure. Okay. Can I just, Bill, just to piggyback that, uh, as recently as this afternoon in the middle of the technology meeting, one of the teachers got a, an email, got a tip where they were given vaccines and she interrupted the uh, scheduled program to ask if she could make an announcement and she did and sent it out to people. So um, the district has been great. Mary Ann, you, Connie, anytime we get a tip, we've been sending them out. And uh, um, we mentioned, or Connie mentioned at the beginning, as recently as last week, Mary Ann contacted the uh, health department again to plead and say, we'd love to have, we heard there was something going over in Port Jervis and we told them, you know, we certainly like the opportunity if that could happen for us. And they said they understood that. Um, and they're certainly keep that in mind. But that was, I think, at least the third time one-on-one uh, -on -one with Marianne that we sent something out. So we got a result and they know we're waiting. And, and we've also just, I think I've said this before, but Connie and um, uh, Linda Baker have both served with the Orange County uh, um, to give shots and to help them out and have worked all through the summer. So we have a great relationship and I have great faith if there's a way for that to happen, uh, Valley Central will get first uh, right of refusal on that. It's just they don't have enough, they didn't have enough vaccines, but I think that's hopefully going to change. Thanks. So I do see that um, Assemblyman Jacobson has joined us and I would be remiss if I didn't um, offer him an opportunity. Um, if you would like to, would you like to say a few words? Uh, no, I'm, I'm fine. I'm, I, I think I just want to, and I'm sure everybody, I'm, I'm as frustrated as everybody else with the way that the vaccination uh, uh, application process has been rolled out. I think we got to have permanent locations so that people don't have to do our version of the Hunger Games, you know, when you find out and it's only going to be good for a day. So we're all pushing for that. And, um, and hopefully uh, you'll get back soon to opening up your classes. And that's, I think we're all on the same page on that. I think that's a bipartisan uh, stand. So for in-person classes, that's it. I'm just here to listen. So we did say we were gonna keep it to an hour and we're at 7.29. So I am gonna um, see if there's someone, um, um, Pasquale, did you wanna, um, ha do you have something else you'd like to say on behalf of the teachers? Sure, um, I'd just uh, like to thank you for inviting us. Um, and 
uh, thank our assembly members for joining us. Um, you know, there's no question that students do belong in the classrooms. Um, teachers do what they do best when they have students in front of them. Um, and, and undoubtedly, that's what we, we look for. Um, there's no substitute for, for the learning that happens in, in our classrooms. Our teachers have met many challenges throughout, the, throughout this year um, and faced them head on, but um, it doesn't take away from the struggles. Um, we've gotten to this point because we followed science-based strategies and we followed health professionals' guidance. Um, and, and we do need to continue to follow that and make sure that any plan that we have in place is gonna be in that science-based realm where we're following guidelines of distancing and protocols with cleaning and mask wearing and all that kind of <clears throat> assurance. Um, I would also implore our assembly members to please ensure that um, our governor takes us seriously in terms of our budget. Um, when we get federally funded, federally federal funding, um, that, that money doesn't supplant money that is already there, that it actually adds to the money that we have so that we can continue to operate the way we need to operate without that money and without funding from our state and from our federal government. Um, it really handcuffs our schools and um, so please keep advocating for us on that level to make sure that our money is not taken away and isn't shifted around, that the money that we get from the federal government actually adds to our, our budgets and doesn't, doesn't take away from it. So thank you for joining us and we really appreciate that. And we're doing all we can for, uh, for education budgets. <clears throat> and we all understand that uh, you know, these are extraordinary times and, uh, you know, 100 years from now, we don't want the, our, our, our children to be uh, studied as the COVID generation. We got to pick things up. It's been a tough year for them. And, you know, we, we need to fund education at the level proper. So, you know, we're still working through the budget. And I'm sure every, all the other assemblymen on this call are 100% behind me, too. Thank you. Thank you. We really appreciate your I can't disclose anything, but we discussed our one house budget by the assembly majority. And I, and if things turn out, like I think you're gonna be very happy, but um, you know, it's just, uh, it's a difficult situation, but I'm optimistic. And I hope that uh, people teach this in uh, social studies class, how elections matter and elections have consequences. And I think, uh, which is why we're able to discuss what's happening with the federal money. So that's a good thing. Okay, so. Marianne, I just want to say to Colin, uh, it filtered down from uh, up a high that you took on uh, the health department up there. And I just want to thank you. Uh, uh, we're very pleased to hear that, that you stood up to support us and uh, as you know, there's always chatter. So a week ago, we heard it was going to be last Wednesday. Then on last Wednesday, we heard it was going to be maybe Friday or Monday. So we're still holding that hope. But thank you all, all you gentlemen, for your support. And uh, we know you're fighting for us. And uh, we appreciate it very much taking time tonight to come and join our community. Thanks again. No, thank, thank you. And I'd like to say I learned some of those questioning skills as the student representative on the Board of Education here at Valley Central. So thanks for having me. And there's a, you covered a lot of important topics. We're here to assist in every way uh, through the budget process, through the vaccine process, and to continue to push for those uh, updated reopening guidelines. So thank you. So there are some more questions in the chat. So I'm going to leave it up to the um, to the panel here. Do you want me to go a few more minutes and try to get through some of those? Um, if it's okay with you, I, I don't mind doing that. Um, so, Mr. Exanthus, um, how about we give it ten more minutes and and try to get through some of these questions here? I think we should be able to do that. So, um, the first question here is in relation to, to the data. Um, and Connie, you might be able to help us with this. Do you have data related to how many planned in-person instructional days have been canceled as a, a result of quarantine? Um, we, I don't have those numbers in front of me, but we absolutely have, do have, have been following that. And Connie, would you say we've seen a trend where increased student populations resulted in more days lost and more quarantines? Yes, we have. And as you know, again, with everything, all the students coming back, I do expect to see more, but we do have that. And I, you know, I know there was a question in reference to coming back from a, you know, um, a holiday time, coming back after a break. 
we do, and that's when people aren't quarantining when they should or traveling those travel guidelines. So I do ask that all parents and all staff, if you're away, please tra follow those travel guidelines and also follow, um, if you're not feeling well, don't come into school because that is what is, what is happening. And, or if you know you're supposed to quarantine, please do so, even if it's from an outside, you know, not outside, outside of school. Um, Connie, would you also say though that we are not seeing a lot of spread within the school or even within the sports teams? I talked to our athletic director today about this as well. Are, are we seeing spread within the schools or is this coming from outside of the building? Most, the majority, I really can't say. I think it's all from outside. It, you know, I can't say it's anything from school. I do have to tell you though, quarantine does work. Um, you know, I was really surprised when we went down to that 10 days. I was very surprised with that because you can still uh, incubate up to 14 days for that virus with the virus. And we have had students that were due to come back as well as staff members who were due to come back. And on day 10, they had symptoms and they tested positive after that. So quarantine does work. I know it's frustrating, but it does work. Um, so the question here is about 100% remote. What will it look like for students if they return to five days a week? It'll, um, in some cases, they may have a 100% instructional teacher, but in many cases, just as they do now, they will most likely have a teacher that teaches students in person and students at home. So there's something in here that talks about, you know, me clarifying the 12% of people who want hybrid to continue. Um, basically what I was saying is that the people that are hybrid now and chose online, if we go back five days a week, I can infer that those 12% would like to keep the hybrid model. Um, there is some questions here about, will we put out another survey specifically to say, which would you prefer five days a week online or hybrid? Could we do that? Absolutely. Um, I think I would like to wait until this current um, survey ends and then speak to the superintendent and the cabinet about their opinions on that, but we will absolutely discuss it. Um, there's a question here about lunches, the three foot distance with masks off for lunchtime. Connie, did you wanna take that or one of the principals? I can take that. So the, if we use those barriers, if those barriers will be used at lunchtime and they have their masks off, we are gonna, the barriers will allow them to be that three foot feet, um, just like they're without masks right now at six feet. So it'll be a more, more protection actually, even though they're in a closer space. So it does, we still have to maintain this up the three feet with the barrier. Otherwise it has to be at six feet. Thank you. There's a question here about, are we keeping virtual learning for kids with underlying conditions? I, I, I believe you're talking about this year, absolutely. There's another question, um, will we have remote instruction next year? You know, I can't answer that at this time, but I think as we get closer to the end of the school year, we'll have more guidance from the state on that. Um, have you found that when a child comes to school unknowingly COVID positive, are they transmitting the virus to other students and staff? If not, is the quarantine strictly precautionary? Connie. So again, it depends on how many people they've had contact with. And when we quarantine them, it is, it is a precautionary quarantine to make sure that no one is affected. Um, so they do have to stay home to watch for symptoms because again, they can incubate up to 14 days later with this virus. So um, I, they do need to quarantine and we have had transmission. So like I said, the majority has not been within school but we have had transmission from within school. Um, question here about the barriers. We said that we're expecting them in a few weeks, but um, we are expecting the Chromebooks in December, on December by Christmas. I thought it was going to be a Christmas present and they still have not arrived. So we are expecting them. Then the question goes on to say, if they don't arrive until May 15th, will you wait until September? Um, again, I'm not sure that I could answer that question right now. We would have to take the pulse of the community at that time to see what their needs are and what they would like us to do. So there's a question here about not allowing a registered student for class, not admitting them into a Google Meet is not meeting the educational needs of the students. Um, to say you cannot provide hybrid is not acceptable. I mean, in, in the normal world, if a student is absent, we don't provide them with instruction on that day. Um, could we possibly, 
Yes. Um, will we be able to? I can't say that clearly now. I think the cabinet, again, would have to discuss this. But when a child is absent, they're absent. This new online um, instruction has kind of muddied those waters. Would one of the principals like to talk to that? Jamie, maybe the question is like, why would we not allow a child that is absent log on if they're a five day a week person? Sorry about that. I'm having That's a hard okay. time there. So, you know, the, the remote, the live streaming is meant to support the kids that are 100% online. So they get that direct instruction. You know, the, the goal of the students being in person is exactly that, to provide that, you know, that, that connection, the instruction within the classroom, just like we would normally do. Students will be provided with their support that they need when they're absent, along with any work that they need to make up and anything along those lines. The great thing is teachers are really using the Google Classroom everywhere. Um, so there are so many resources on there on a regular basis, even if a student is absent, um, truly they, they, they're always connected, right? This is the probably the silver lining of all of this right now in this pandemic is that there is this constant connection due to the, the internet and due to our Google Classroom use. So. Um, the kids have multiple opportunities to um, make up that work and be able to stay on track. Thanks, Jamie. And, and the other very good point is that um, if you're absent, we're assuming that you're sick. Um, and if you're sick, then um, just as if we had a teacher, um, if we had a teacher that wasn't feeling well, we wouldn't allow them to stay home and teach remotely that day, um, as opposed to coming in. Um, we're assuming the child's not feeling well and that they don't really, um, they can't come to school so that they aren't feeling well enough to participate in instruction for that day. Uh, so, how many parents want to have their children 100% online? So, um, the other night when I left, I guess that would be Monday night, I did give that answer. Let me just, if you could just give me a second, sorry. Um, I can, you know, I, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna share the survey results. So once the survey closes, what I'll do is I will cut and paste those charts into a document and I will have um, Ms. Bear um, put them on our website and she will share out on social media and we'll send a message to let you know that they're out there so that you can see directly the results of that survey. Are there 100% online teachers for the high school and middle school courses currently? Um, correct me if I'm wrong, um, but not at the high school and, and in small amounts at the middle school. Okay, It's very difficult. Every student, and Jamie taught me that well, every student in the, um, in the high school basically has their own schedule. So it's very difficult to do what we're able to do in the smaller settings. There's a question about summer school being provided for students who want to remain 100% remote. Um, right now, our summer school program is going to be in person. So um, we will again look into that more um, as we get closer to the summer. But as of right now, our plan is to have in-person instruction for summer school. Can a child take a COVID test instead of quarantining? Go ahead, Connie. I know the answer, but I'm gonna let you give it. The answer is no, um, they cannot take a uh, test. It has to be the quarantine for the full 10 days because again, anybody that's been exposed could be incubating for up to 14 days. So a negative COVID test will not allow them to come back to school any sooner. Um, thank you, Connie. Oh, this isn't just, I'm going to read this. I send all you my deepest gratitude, knowing that you're all doing the best you can in the situation you're in with the people you're with, given all of the constraints. Thank you very much, um, Eve Boyle. That is very kind of you. Um, there's a question here about middle school and high school students carrying the barriers. Did you want to take that, Mr. Burns? Yeah, we have discussed this. Uh, at this point, from what we can uh, gather, we looked at the dimensions of the barriers. Uh, they seem very light. 
a typical high school student wouldn't have any problem going from class to class. And uh, so basically what we would be expecting the students to do is to carry that barrier uh, from class to class. They would be getting it um, in the morning and then uh, bringing that from class to class. That's correct. They do have a handle on them that um, makes it easier to um, bring with you. I think we heard that. Sorry, I'm just scrolling through. Yeah, I think I've answered this one, but yes, if, if students are quarantined, that's not their fault. They're not sick, they're just quarantined. So we would absolutely provide instruction for them. Marianne, there's a question here. Has Valley Central given any thought to graduation? Yes, man, every day we told them get moving. So um, yes, at all levels, at the eighth grade, uh, high school, um, the elementaries, we talk about it all the time. We've been talking about that, I would say, probably since January, um, you know, about trying to, you know, bring people together and groups together to start thinking about how we can do this. The high school just did an amazing job with the Winterfest, um, but we absolutely want to have in-person graduations and moving up ceremonies, and we're going to do our very best to do that. Brad, is there any other one in there that you think is we should answer? Go ahead. Unfortunately, I don't think we're going to get through all of them, but there's a question here. Uh, why are we not having a pause after spring break? What's the difference after the Christmas break? Go ahead, Connie. Well, I can answer part of that. Um, the reason why we took the break at, at Christmas time or after Thanksgiving, I should say, was because our health commissioner had asked, uh, um, it was a recommendation by the health commissioner to slow that spread. And I know there was some comments in there that the, it has gone up and yes, it has. And especially after that break, but we were asking um, to quarantine or not sort of, but to pause at that time so that it would give us a chance to lower that spread. It did not work. So I don't think they're, and they're not requesting it any at this time. So we're not gonna do it. It's not a recommendation. Okay, which other one you have in there, Brad? It's, uh, I'm looking, I think most of these we've kind of covered. Um, what will happen if you do not get more responses to the survey that was sent out? How will that affect decision making in terms of opening five days a week uh, to a full student body? Uh, we'll get them. I mean, when we did the um, we, I'll send something out again tomorrow. Right now, I think we have um, close to 3,000. Um, there's 4,200 students in our district, um, give or take a few. Um, many of those are already coming back five days a week. So we will look at how many students we have and how many um, responses we have. There was something in here that asked if I could leave it up over the weekend so that people had a time to think about it and do it over the weekend. And that's absolutely fine. Um, we will not close it until um, um, Sunday night. We'll close it so that next week we can start disaggregating the data. I will tell you that principals are already in the data, looking at it, um, looking at who wants to come back, who doesn't, to try to build their plan. So um, we're on it and we will continue. And uh, maybe a last one for tonight. Uh, this one also goes to Connie. As allergy season is starting, we have a lot of children and staff that suffer with sneezing and coughing, how are we handling uh, so that people aren't uh, quarantined unnecessarily? So if a child has allergies or um, any other chronic condition that may cause symptoms like a cough or something, asthma, we are still are asking that you be checked by your healthcare provider. We have to, I can't tell you how many times we've had someone that we've told to go to the doctor and they said, well, it's just a cough it was just a cough, it was just a tickle in my throat, it was just a runny nose, I thought it was my allergies and they have tested positive. So any symptom, if they're in there and you do need to take your child to the healthcare provider and give us a note stating that yes, these are allergies or a staff member, the same thing, we've asked staff members to get those notes saying that they can, they know when these are just allergies and when they're not, you know, when that's not a symptom of COVID. Most doctors will give you a note over the phone um, if it, it's truly an allergy season and they have pollen, we do know those allergies and if we have it documented, if we don't have anything documented, it's hard for us to make that decision. But we do ask if we're seeing symptoms, even though they are minor or what you feel is minor, 
they could not be, they might not be, and they might be COVID. So we do ask that you do get a healthcare provider note. We are not quarantining those individuals, but we are asking you to get a healthcare provider note to clear them. The state it wasn't. Thank, thank you, Connie, and, and thank you to um, all of the panelists that are here with us tonight, and thank you to the assemblymen that took their time out of their busy schedules to come and join us. Um, I know there's more questions in the chat, but again, I'm going to say, you know, you have you can call me, um, you have my extension 18142, and you can call your building principals. Um, we'll be happy to answer your questions at any time, um, email. Um, often you'll email me a question and sometimes my answer will always be, um, this is my extension, please call me because it's often a lot better to have a conversation than to try to answer an email. So please call and if I can't answer you immediately, I will get back to you within a few days. Um, with that, John, did you wanna close up for us? Oh, sorry. Thank everybody. Uh, as I started uh, the meeting, I can't thank the whole school community, all those steely-eyed uh, missile men, as I said, just extraordinary work under very difficult uh, circumstances. But the community has been great in supporting what we've tried to accomplish. And uh, again, I want to thank uh, the gentlemen tonight, uh, our assemblymen, for coming and giving their time. And uh, we really appreciate it. It's nice that you, you could take the time to spend some time in Valley Central and I know, as I said, we, we know you're fighting hard for us and we have great faith that, uh, that hopefully something better than we anticipated was gonna come out of this budget now with that uh, COVID bill that was passed in Washington. We're hoping for some uh, a better result and maybe to uh, some expense aid on, all, on the money we're spending, everyone's spending for COVID. That would be a great help to us also. So thanks again, everyone. All right. Well, thank you all. And again, um, we thank you for everything you're doing. We thank the teachers for everything they're doing and our administrators are working so hard. And with that, just please call if you have any questions. Thank you. And thank you to the Board of Education, who is a great support as well. Have night a great April. night.